Well, good afternoon. And as our uh, fearless leader, President Levina Holmes said, I'm Jane Williams, and I am a member of the San Francisco Alumni Chapter, and I have been with the sorority for almost 50 years now. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I'm very honored to uh, serve as the moderator for our eighth annual Bay Area authors speak out and really honored to be amongst these, these wonderful uh, authors and artists and just beautiful, beautiful black women. Um, with us today are, and you can see their, their photos on, the, on this screen, is Dr. Sarah Ladipo Menica, Mauricia Gabriel, and Francine Thomas Howard. And each of them will uh, present uh, their works with us and share their works with us, and I will be asking them a few questions, and then we will have a uh, Q&A with the audience. So as they're presenting, you can kind of think of some very uh, inspiring questions to ask of our panelists. And each of our panelists came to their writing craft and passion for the arts and literature through different journeys and paths but as you will hear, each of them also share a similar voice that in their work expresses the wisdom, the strength, the power, the vulnerability, and the sensuality of African-American women and women of the African diaspora in a historical and modern day sense. So I think you'll see a nexus between their work even though each one is quite different. So we'll begin our conversation today with Sarah. Sarah Mendika is a daughter of Nigerian and British parents. Sarah spent her childhood in Nigeria and has lived and traveled around the world. And fortunately, she has made her home in San Francisco. Dr. Mendika holds a PhD from UC Berkeley and teaches literature at San Francisco State University. In addition to her writings as an essayist, short stories, and public speaker, she is active in various civic and professional organizations, including being on the board of directors of the Museum of the African Diaspora here in San Francisco. Sarah's first book, novel, Independence, was published in 2008 and has received several international recognitions. Her most recent book, Like a Mule, Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun, the props, <laughs> has received numerous rave reviews and acknowledgments, including being shortlisted for the distinguished 2016 Goldsmiths Prize, a quote, reward for fiction that breaks the mold. And Sarah has certainly broken the mold with this work, and we're very proud of her. So let's begin. I'm going to begin with an obvious question, and, and each of you will be getting the same questions, so you can be thinking about it, but you're gonna start out. And how would you describe the story of Like a Mule bringing ice cream to the sun? And what inspired you to do this work? Well, I first want to say thank you so much to this fabulous sorority for inviting us. It's a great honor for me to be here with my fellow authors, and thank you to all of you for coming. It's great to be here, and it's great to be in San Francisco's main library, which is just so wonderful. So thank you also for hosting us. Uh, so Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun took me about a month to memorize my own title. Uh, <laughs> it is the story of, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me tell you a story. Let's say, let's just imagine a woman her name is Mariah Da Silva, and she is on the cusp of 75, and she's a fabulous woman. It's not hard to imagine a fabulous 75-year-old woman, because I see some women that uh, look, I know there's one woman that's a few decades older, and she looks like she's 75, so she's a fabulous woman, and uh, she is a retired professor, and she likes to spend her time in San Francisco going on walks and meeting neighborhood friends and friends from uh, across the years. And as she meets her friends, she'll often talk about what sounds like a very uh, 
glamorous international life. She lived in India, she lived in France, and some people might not actually believe her when she says, I met with Mrs. Gandhi, or I went to Buckingham Palace for tea, but she is the former uh, wife of an ambassador, and so these stories are actually true. She also loves to drive, and she has a car that she has named Buttercup, and it's a fast sports car. So she's larger than life, and she's a very sensual woman as well. And uh, she, towards the beginning of the story, she has a fall, and this shakes all her certainties. She's very independent, and she has a fall, and you have to read the rest of the book to see what happens. <laughs> but it, it's essentially a story of her life and her unusual set of friends in San Francisco, which include uh, a woman who is homeless and a Palestinian shopkeeper. In terms of inspirations for the story, um, I love what Toni Morrison says, which is, if there is a story that you want to read and cannot find, go write it. So that is what I attempted to do with, well, both of my novels. And I wasn't finding very many books about older women and almost no books about older black women. And these are the stories that I want to read. So uh, that was the inspiration. And, and while I wasn't finding these stories, I was meeting fabulous women with incredible stories. So that was part of the inspiration. Well, you mentioned Dr. Maria's friends in the book. And the characters and her, her friends are so charismatic and interesting. It feels like you know them. Or you can say, oh, this is so-and-so as you're reading through the book, and I actually read it twice, because I read it again last night, because after I heard your presentation at MOAD, I got a different perspective of your book that I had missed the first time that I read it. So were your characters uh, based on true life people? Well, I, I think uh, you know, you know, my fellow writers can can answer that as well. And I think as writers, as we walk around the world, we're observing, we're eavesdropping, and so I, you know, all of my characters, all of my stories are in some way inspired uh, by people that I come across. I think there's also a little bit of me in probably most of my characters, and I think also, you know, I was, I was really intrigued to read about Francine's work and Massey's work as well. Um, and, and uh, you, know, you can correct me if you're wrong, but I think there's a very strong oral tradition mm. that feeds your work. Mm. Certainly there's a strong oral tradition that feeds my work. And uh, so, yeah, this is also something else with the, behind my character. So listening and, and listening to stories, those stories told to me or that I overhear, bits of it make their way into my work. So your story takes place in San Francisco and actually it, uh, Dr. Moreo lives close to a neighborhood where I live in San Francisco. And she's um, very, um, she loves the city and the people in the city and the vibrancy of San Francisco. Maybe not Clusterfest, but <laughs> <laughs> she, maybe she would pass on that. <clears throat> but could the story have been told in any of the other cities that you have lived around the world and in, throughout the country? Um, or was San Francisco really yeah, something I, special that you chose as your as your scene? I, I, I think in the last few years I have been writing much more about where I am based, uh, where I've lived for the past 20 years. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Nigeria, and as you said, my mother's British, so uh, in terms of where I come from and nationalities, those are my nationalities, but... I have an African American son, and so this is this is also home to me. Even though, um, under the current administration, I am still an alien, uh, something, what it, whatever, <laughs> for whatever. <laughs> I still claim <laughs> Americanness because I live here, and so you know the issues that are happening here. You know, if they affect they affect all of us. So I think I I was really. You know, after writing my first novel, which was set in West Africa, in Nigeria, and uh, in Oxford, uh, England, I was really ready to write a story here. Uh -huh. Well, it's real, sp very special, and and the title that you re finally memorized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you come up with that? So I don't know about you, but I'm always drawn to titles that leave room for the imagination. So titles like. Uh, name of the Rose or um, 
Toni Morrison's latest one, God Bless the Child, God Help the Child. I keep confusing it with the song, uh, but uh, that, that just leave room for, for the imagination. So I, when I was finishing this book, I was reading a poem by uh, an American poet, Mary Rufel, and her poem is entitled Donkey On. And in the last stanza of the poem, the character in the poem is handed an extra year of life. We're not quite sure by whom, but it could be uh, some, you know, it could be God. And the last stanza of the poem goes like this. She's being given this extra year of life, and the, the last stanza goes, the only question is how to spend it. So I carry it on my back like a mule bringing ice cream to the sun. So again, I've just said leave room for the imagination, but for me, this image, the imagery and the way that it kind of speaks to the brevity of life, bittersweetness of life, it seemed somewhat appropriate to the story that I was trying to tell. Now, I'm going to, uh, it might be a longer answer than, <laughs> than we have time for, but you, your publishing was, not, was done by a African and European publisher and not a traditional uh, American, United States publisher. And was that done purposefully or just out of necessity? Was, uh, so yeah, so I chose to publish with Cassava Republic Press, which is a Nigerian press. And <clears throat> actually, you know, I, I haven't thought about this for a while, but Walter Mosley was someone who um, has really touched me in terms of the way he thinks about publishing and who gets to publish stories and so forth. Um, I won't go into his story now, but I will say that um, I became very um, aware of the way that publishing works for a lot of African writers um, in, in, in the in that a lot of stories written by Africans are published by American or European publishers, which is absolutely fine, but often what happens is that, that uh, the stories are not available in the continent. And so I, I, I always said that if I was to publish a second book and if I were able to, I would like to give uh, world rights to a Nigerian publisher that would then sell them. So rather than all of the rights being sold to Africa, to have them in the position to sell rights to other places, which is what's happened with this book. And it's absolutely fantastic. And you know, it's, it's, it's not just an altruistic decision. It's, you know, I love this book cover. It's not a baobab tree or a sunset or, you know, all the other, you know, zebras and giraffes, <laughs> all the other stereotypes that one might think of, which in the past have, found their way to book covers. Um, so it's really exciting for me to have a publisher that gets what I'm trying to do and I don't have to feel that I have to explain things all the time. And again, linking this back to someone like Toni Morrison who talks about, uh, you know, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't feel the need to explain. And um, so similarly, um, that was something that was important for me. Well, can you share some of your readings, your work with us? Sure. Today. So I thought I would read two pages. The first, the opening paragraph, so you get um, a sense of my main character. And, uh, and then I thought I would read a little uh, passage later on in the book. And it's, it's a bit of a downer of a passage. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about what's happening in the world literally in the last few days in cities that I know well, in London, a recent incident in Italy. and. Um, I watched Do the Right Thing last night again, and just, you know, just there's a lot of pain in this world. And um, I just thought I would read a passage that sort of speaks to that as well. So, uh, the first paragraph, you are meeting Mariah Da Silva for the first time, and she lives in San Francisco, and this is her talking about where she lives. The place where I live is ancient, old but sturdy. That's what our landlady tells us. 500 Belgrave is so strong, apparently, that it withstood the 1906 earthquake. Didn't even bust a single crack. That's the way my landlady says it. But between you and me, I wouldn't bet on history repeating itself. That's the reason why I live on the top floor. For if this building collapses, then at least they won't have far to dig me out. Of course, I don't wish any harm to my neighbors especially not to the gentleman living just beneath me. 
As for the sullen woman on the ground floor who insists on calling me Mary because she finds Morayo too hard to pronounce, well, that's another story. But I wish even her no harm. You know, I'd like to imagine that when the big one strikes, we will all be gathered at my place, enjoying a glass of Sauvignon Blanc, and we'd ride the whole thing out and live to tell the tale. But who knows? You know, when the earth finally decides that it's tired of fidgeting and it needs a proper stretch, I might be the one walking downstairs. And if that's the case, then the only survivors will be my books, hundreds of them, to keep each other company. So that's the opening paragraph. And I'm going to skip to chapter eight, where she's still in her kitchen and she is uh, thinking about northern Nigeria, which is where she comes from and grew up. One morning, as I stood in my San Francisco kitchen drinking coffee, I opened my newspaper to find on the cover an aerial shot showing bodies in joss wrapped in brightly colored Ankara prints. From a distance, they looked almost beautiful, scattered like crayons in a jumbo-sized box until I read the headline and I peered closer and I saw that some of the bodies were splattered and many soaked in a deeper red, not belonging to the original fabric. People ought to have been safe up there where they hid in the trees, where we used to hide as children. But these mad people had chased them even there before smoking them out, some burning, as they fell from the branches. The date was September 11, 2001. I started sending money back home to the orphans, even though I couldn't always be sure whether the money would reach those most affected. It felt better to be doing something rather than nothing. For how was it possible that this had happened in my home city, the place where I had grown up, the place where I once described as the warmest, most generous place on earth, where parents routinely took it upon themselves to look after everyone else's children or discipline them if need be, the place where one always cooked more than the number of people in one's household in case others dropped by, the place where old people were never relegated to stuffy barracks to sit for hours waiting for death, the place where vegetable sellers routinely gave their loyal customers a dash of several guavas or a small calabash of tomatoes for the evening stew, something small for free. The place where people said sorry whenever someone tripped or fell or grazed themselves because that was the linguistic mirror of a culture based on empathy, having nothing to do with who was at fault and the place where Muslims celebrated Christmas and Christians broke the fast during Ramadan with their Muslim brothers and sisters, the place where grown men held hands and grown women walked arm in arm, the place where the term cousin was never used because all cousins were brothers or sisters, the place where Sundays were spent visiting friends and relatives, the place where weddings and funerals and naming ceremonies and baptisms and graduations and independence celebrations and governor's parties were lavish and celebratory. The place where everyone knew your family. The place where the type of atrocities you read about in history class concerning the Germans, the Russians, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Nicaraguans, the Boers, all those foreign people was never supposed to happen to you or to your loved ones, ever, until one day it did, and worse. Mm, beautiful, thank you. <laughs> well, next we have Maurice Sia Gabriel. And Maurice is a shining example of the generation of young socially conscious writers poets, lyricists, and artists that have captured the emotion, the spirit, the beauty, the challenges, the sensuality of black women in today's world. A Bay Area native, Mauricia grew up in an environment of art, 
culture, and black political and social consciousness. And she bravely and poetically articulates her life journey in her first book, I Twirl in the Smoke. <laughs> <Your props. laughs> I Twirl in the Smoke is described as a collection that, quote, traces one woman's story from youth to motherhood, from pain and insecurity to self-confident and self-actualization. Mauricia is a graduate of Howard University, where she received her BA in French in anthropology and Middlebury, Middlebury College in France, where she received her master's degree in French language and literature. She describes herself as an educator, speaker, poet, author, and Afro-Caribbean Francophile. And most importantly, she is the proud mother of two beautiful daughters. <laughs> So, Mauricia, yes. <laughs> I'm going to ask you that same question. Okay. Uh, if you would give us the pleasure of briefly describing your book and what inspired you to do your writing. Thank you for that beautiful introduction first. <laughs> Very poetic. <laughs> um, so what inspired me to write this book? When I was in... Uh, I'll just start with the title and where the image came from. When I was in high school, uh, a, a student from Cal came to my class and she was Haitian. And she talked about the Haitian Revolution and just gave us all the information that she could to inspire us. And we quickly became close friends and she became kind of like a mentor to me. And one time I came over her house and she was, she had a sage stick, a smudge stick and she was burning it and she was twirling around and she was just, and I was in awe of this image and I asked her, you know, why she was doing it and she was trying to cleanse some things and she was talking about some past life experiences and how in the past life she was her mother's mother and apparently she'd done something to her mother and it was affecting their relationship this life. It was all so magical in terms of what she embodied and what she brought and taught and so that image of her twirling in the smoke, basically her trying to cleanse and repair and come to terms with um, some things in her life captured what this book was for me, me trying to cleanse some memories, capture some things and come to term with um, some events in my life. And some people have remarked like, they're amazed that I could remember so much. Although some people will say that all memory is fiction, but to, as the extent that, you know, I could, to the extent that it's true for me, for my memory, <laughs> I do have a long memory. And part of this book is trying to get rid of some of that memory, putting it somewhere where it's there to be learned from, but I don't have to carry it anymore. So that was um, a part of it. At the time that I wrote this book, I was teaching at a continuation high school. So a lot of my students were dealing with a lot of trauma. A lot of them, learning disabilities, they were uh, facing, uh, a lot of their peers were dying, a lot of, some of my students died. So at the, at the context for this book is me living in West Oakland uh, and seeing a lot of those, what are they called, um, those altars, from street altars from people being murdered. Working in a high school with a population that's highly traumatized and myself vicariously becoming traumatized uh, being a single parent of, at that time, very small children and trying to, you know, when you become a parent, then you start to face your childhood differently as well, the memories of your childhood differently and your own relationship with your parents. So all of that is the context for this book. So it deals with a lot of loss and then also how I respond and gain from that. Well, it's a, it's a deeply, deeply personal story, a personal book. And in your preface, you write, quote, I wrote this book so I could hear my voice. I wanted to feel complete. If I had kept these words in my journals where they began, my life would have felt inert and incomplete. So did your writing satisfy that urge to hear your voice? It did. It satisfied it. And it also rekindled my love for music. So it, it, it channeled me into or tunneled me into uh, yet another 
stage of development where I could really feel satisfied at hearing myself. Mm -hmm. and, and you talked about your memory. You, you recollect a lot about your childhood, and I was really impressed with your ability to ref in your in your writings to reflect on experiences going back to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I don't think I remember anything about kindergarten <laughs> about sand except sandbox. <laughs> but you expressed very socially and political feelings right. um, as a as a child mm -hmm. and injustices that were incurring in the black community. And so you really had a sense of self at a very early age. And how do you account for that and what influenced that? Well, I was, I was born into the Black Panther Party. Both of my parents were. Um, uh, my father's the former minister of culture, the Black Panther Party, and my mother was an artist and teacher in the party. So I was raised with, uh, born into the, the preschool, the daycare, and then after the party ended, I went to the summer school, and my mother was constantly telling me narrating, uh, I guess when we would go see a movie, you know, she would point things out to me about, so I guess she was constantly in engaging me in critical thought process with the world and art and the media. Mm -hmm. your, mother, your mother is incorporated in your book. In the end of your book, you have an interview with your mother, which I thought was very interesting. I hadn't seen that in, right. in any readings that I have encountered, and it was an interview that you had, a very personal interview you have with your mother, um, and it's almost like asking her how she felt about the book mm -hmm. and asking for her, was it asking her approval, or were you getting uh, I, her? I think, oh. <laughs> I think I kind of wanted her voice a little bit, and a part of it was because when I started the book, there was a lot more that involved her. And she, she gave me permission to include those things. It was a lot of sensitive material. And I had a community of peers do like a community editing for me before I had a professional proofreader. So since it included information that was sensitive about her life, although it was also my life, I felt it was important because I couldn't disguise it. I felt it was important for her to at least say yay or nay, or I'm too shy about that, or too, I don't want that revealed. So then when I did it, because it's also kind of a, in a way, a, some people view it maybe as a critique of my childhood in, in certain aspects, or it shows certain things that are very, um, that are sensitive or hurtful from childhood. So I wanted her also to be able to have a say in, in, in it as well, since it does reveal like there's some incomplete and hurtful things that took place. Mm -hmm. That was very, maybe therapeutic too. Yes. Uh -huh. So your publishing experience was different <laughs> than Sarah's and um, more of a kind of a do-it-yourself self-publishing yes. experience. And so you want to share Yes. A little of that with us? Like a guerrilla publisher. <laughs> I uh, hired my friend, Laura Amin, to do the cover and the layout. I, I, I uh, hired a proofreader to help me with the process of it, of the, the writing. Um, I then sent the, electronically sent the material to uh, a printer in Los Angeles, and that was the process of publishing my book. It was getting every piece. I hired somebody. Oh, I also had a coach. You, I, I outlined that, though, also in the introduction, that I had a coach, kind of a life coach, and he helped me uh, get through some maybe barriers that I had that might have, because I was also a working mother, as I told you, a working single mother. So the coach helped keep me motivated and have the momentum and carve out the time. Not motivated, I was motivated, but he helped me with timing issues and self-esteem issues around presenting my voice to the public. Mm -hmm. So your book was published in 2011, I believe. Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and since that time, you've been involved in other projects and activities and mm -hmm. 
aspects of art. You want to describe where your journey has sure. come over the years? So um, having written this book, I, I accompanied my father to Mexico to because he was participating in a, a Zapatista conference there. And the director found out that I was a poet, asked me to introduce my father. From that point, I, I wrote a poem to introduce him. And then I was also asked to perform at a New Year's event there. They paired me with some musicians. We practiced maybe two hours tops. And then we performed a couple of my pieces. And that was it. And was like, that's it. I'm making music. <laughs> it was such a love fest between myself and those musicians. It's, it's on YouTube as well if you'd like to see it. I, I, was, I was amazed. We were all amazed. And people, I asked them, well, what, what music, what kind of music, what genre of music is this? And they said, well, we don't know. We're just following you. So I said, well, <laughs> I'm going to try and get some more people to follow me. <laughs> Well, why don't we follow you and, and hear some of your work? Okay. Well, um, I'll start off with uh, the olive green ribbon. And Do you want to use the microphone or is that fine? Well, this is okay because okay. this is for the uh, little, it's a little short story. This, this is a book of poems and prose. So this is a, a little short story. My grandmother took a scrap of olive green material from the floor and fiddled with it under her sewing light. I stood obediently by as she stuck a safety pin through it. Here you go, she said, as she turned from her machine and squinted her eyes to find the right spot to pin the ribbon on me. I was wearing my favorite t-shirt, a light blue baby tee with a photo of me and my father printed on the front. In the photo, I was sitting on his lap with my arm around his neck, making a snaggletooth grin. I love this shirt, and I wore it every chance I got. So it was auspicious to me that I would also wear it the day that my grandmother pinned the olive green ribbon on me. It was 1981, and I was in the first grade. The evening news was saturated with updates about black children being kidnapped in Atlanta. It seemed like police were finding bodies of missing children every day beside freeways and streams and dragged from the woods. I tried to disconnect myself from what I was hearing, but it was difficult. Those children were all black, and so was I. Our color felt like more than a coincidence, and I was deeply afraid. I played disassociation games to distinguish myself from them. I was a girl. They were boys. I was in Oakland. They were in Atlanta. I hoped that was enough to keep me safe. But I also had a little brother. I couldn't help but wonder, was he as safe as me? If we lived in Atlanta, would he be dead now? Anxiety gnawed away at me every day. I was one of the first children at my school to wear the green ribbon. I was proud to announce my solidarity with the families of murdered children. I also felt that the ribbon had a special pr protective quality that would prevent me from being kidnapped. So I wore my favorite t-shirt with the little green ribbon as often as I could. Eventually, it became so much a part of my routine that I forgot I was standing for a cause. I began to hear less about the murders on the news, and the deaths of the children in Atlanta became normalized. Then one day, a classmate ran up to me at recess. You're supposed to wear it the other way now, she said. I was puzzled. She'd never worn one. I was the first in class to have it, and now she was telling me how to wear it. She saw the look on my face and proudly announced, you wear it up like a smile now because it's over. They found the killer. And I'll just leave it there. You can read the rest. <laughs> I have time for another? Yes, okay. Yes, please. So, so uh, I'll, I'll stay in my seat for the... Oh, okay. And uh, as I said, this is a book is a journey, so I also go into... Tried to, I tried to give a little bit to myself as a woman without just looking at my mother and my children, but I tried to give some to myself. So I wrote this poem, and it was inspired by Sandra Cisneros' You Bring Out the Mexican in Me. And it, it, I wanted it to be an artifact. Like I wanted it to be like if you were to, to find this poem on the street in like 20, 30 years in Oakland, it would show you what Oakland was because Oakland's changing so much. It's like, I want something that's like an artifact, and archaeologists would be like, oh, this is what Oakland was. <laughs> so you, it's called You Bring Out the Oakland in Me. 
You bring out the rebel in me, the dark velvet feline tender and fierce, a beautiful black panther. You bring out the West Oakland African in me, the warrior queen who took burnt land and grew culture like forest on indigenous burial ground. You are the one I would try to stay home for. Maybe, just maybe, have another baby for. Allow you to enter my sacred spaces and pray at my altar before dawn. You, only you. You bring out the 79th and Lockwood in me, the 92nd and Hillside, the attitude that melts plastic and sets your libido on fire. Phonies get scared, but you, you bring it out and get ignited, so I keep it lit 100% for you. You bring out IET, Angola, and Brazil in me, the Atlantic and Caribbean Sea, the diaspora black in me, the Olmec stoneheads with cornrows, the Mayan comedic connection. You bring out the Ifa Santeria and Candomblé in me, the Pentecostal Vodun High Priestess in me. I could lead thousands of slaves to freedom and still come home and surrender to you. You bring out the black eyed peas and collard greens on New Year's Day in me. The starvation fast on Thanksgiving in me. The no religion having sinner in me. The questioner of all things. The answerer to my own intuition. The creator of my own rhythm. The pretty girl with ebony eyes. The one that Stevie Wonder made songs about. The one that lures tourists into ghettos, favelas, and shanty towns. You bring out the quilombos in me the Angoleta and Hyena and Zynga in me. You bring out the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, church on Sunday talking in tongues in me, and it's just Friday afternoon. I now pronounce you all mine. I will paint your body in red ochre, douse you in the fragrant scent of God's liqueur. You can play in my locks when we're done. I will cross your heart with my beads of sweat, anointed in lilac wine. Now everyone will know you are mine. You, my love, only you can get this. Love the way an Oakland woman loves. Come, let me show you now. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, that's fabulous. And that was featured at the Oakland Museum's mm -hmm. exhibit, mm -hmm. um, Black Panther exhibit recently. Yes. And <laughs> wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. So last but not least, Francine Thomas Howard. And Francine's journey, as we've heard, uh, as a full-time writer flourished after her successful career as a pediatric occupational therapist. Francine earned her BA from San Jose State and master's degree from the University of San Francisco. Her love for writing resulted in turning remarkable stories of her family's history, genealogy, and oral history into writings, which she had little thought of publishing. But to all of our good fortune, she wrote her first novel, Page from a Tennessee Journal, and submitted it to the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award Contest, which ultimately resulted in her being contacted by Amazon Press. In 2016, Francine published her next novel, The Daughter of Union County, a historical fiction based on her own family's oral history and anecdotal information passed down over the decades. As we will hear, it is a spellbinding story spanning decades from Reconstruction to World War II of a courageous African-American family that maintains a deep family secret out of love for family and survival. So Francine, again, 
we'd like for you to share a little bit about your story and how you were inspired to take on this 420-page <laughs> journal journey. Well, again, first of all, thank you so very much for inviting me to participate on this illustrious panel. I feel very um, honored and very humbled to sit beside these very talented ladies. Um, the book, the back cover of the book says, the story is about a mother's love, a father's legacy, a scandalous family secret. But there's more to it than that. These words were written by my publisher, but there's much more. It's also a tale of uh, betrayal, of greed, of racial passing, of a possible murder, and a land grab on a gargantuan scale. And let me give you a little bit of the background of this story. Um, this story is based upon my late husband's family's oral history. They were from Union County. They were from Smackover. In the early 1920s, there was a humongous oil strike in Smackover. That strike occurred on my husband's family's land. That's what inspired me to write this story. Um, the, the protagonist of the story, the daughter of Union County, well, as uh, many of you know who have uh, oral family histories, one branch of the family has one side of the set of tales to tell, the other one tells you something else. Uh, Aunt Susie swears that dress was blue, that great, great, great grandma uh, Isabel wore, and while Uncle Sam says, no, you know that dress was pink. So uh, they're different versions. But uh, in writing my husband's family story about this awful land grab, I focused upon a, a, a real woman. In the book, I've called her Margaret. One branch says that she was the, the, the daughter of the white land owner and his white wife. I called the wife um, uh, Bertha in the book. But the other branch of the family, and they are just as insistent, they say, no, 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 uh, you got it wrong. <laughs> she was really the daughter of the white land owner and his biracial house servant, who I call Salome in the book. Salome, uh, their family story says, was a mixture of um, African American and Native American. I chosen the latter version of the story, because I'm trying to balance all these various elements I'm getting from uh, the, my in-laws, but I've chosen her to be uh, as passing into the white world because it brings up a lot of um, decisions. When this oil strike happened, um, she and her two brothers, she had two brothers who were just a, a tad too brown skin to pass as white. She was the white one, they weren't, but they were full siblings. When this oil strike happened, as you know, with, uh, when there's a, a, a boom like the California gold rush or the, that um, Alaska gold strike in, in the Klondike, everybody in the world rushes to get a piece of the action. Everybody wants to do what they can to grab some of that land. That's what happened at Smackover. They wanted to become overnight millionaires. Um, let me just tell you that uh, I'm not the widow of an overnight billionaire. <laughs> Something happened. But imagine if you were this young woman and you're, you've inherited a, last, a, a large tract of land from your, your now deceased father. The in-laws tell me that this spot of land in Arkansas was six miles long and a mile wide. That's an awful lot of land, especially when it's all jam-packed full of oil. Now, people were coming to get this oil, but you know this was 19, early 1920s. It was Arkansas. It was the time of Jim Crow. 
black folks were not going to be allowed to keep the land that they owned. I'm sure many of you out there have stories of land grabs, but it was just the, the gargantuan nature of this land that was taken from this family. If you are this young woman who, as for all her world knows, is white, what do you do? Do you step into helping your brothers? Do you try to protect them? Because everybody is trying to take their land by um, deceit, by fraud, and most of all, by threats of murder. And in actuality, some of my uh, in-laws were killed because they would not sign. You're this white woman, what do you do? Do you help them or do you shrink yourself back into the, the land of, of white privilege and say nothing? Or do you try to straddle the two worlds? Can you meld your two positions? Who knows? I don't know what I would have done, and I ask, what would you have done? And that's the story of the daughter of Union County. <laughs> Well, as, as you said, you've acknowledged that your, your story is based on oral history, and this is to quote you, oral history, some real, some real life historical events, and some liberties for creative effect. And some of the critics, and in, in this world of social media, everyone can be a critic, some of the critics have criticized the historical accuracy of um, the book. And so how do you respond to those critics, if at all? Well, luckily, at last, at last look, I think I had, what, 1,700 um, uh, reviews. How I respond is, I don't read them, because there's going to be <laughs> five-star reviews and one-star reviews. I figure I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, <laughs> but as far as, as the truth of the story, and you're right, I've had to disguise a number of events and switch things around because I have in-laws to this very day. I have a sister-in-law who is still terrified that if she goes back to Arkansas and stirs in that pot, she could be killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, what are we, June 2017? So yes, I've disguised some events, but uh, the core truth of that family story is in this book. Mm -hmm. um, I'd venture to guess that there's a lot of black folks, black folks here who um, could tell a story of a relative or somebody they know who has passed or yeah, attempted yeah. to pass for white. And I was really um, impressed with the non-scientific DNA tests that the midwives <laughs> would use when a child was born to check behind the ear right, yeah. to see whether or not it was dark, to see what color the baby would be when it grew up. Now we have the more scientific DNA test and genealogies and finding your roots. So how has that storyline resonated, the passing, the passing part of your your story uh, has how has that resonated with your reading, your audience and the readers? I, I think that uh, it's interesting. I, I do have a um, sort of a wide readership. In fact, I, I've uh, with this book and with my uh, previous two books, um, I have they've sold sort of internationally. And I, I wonder, with questions like that, because uh, it interests me uh, greatly, I mean, this passing story. But people uh, bought my books who live in India, in Canada, Australia, um, China, I mean, everywhere. And these, this story seems to resonate with them, too, that this is what people have done, what uh, uh, African-American people have had to do to survive. My, my husband, um, whose story, family story this is, uh, was a light-skinned African-American man, but he only used that one time, he told me, to pass into the white world, and that was to attend his father's funeral. Mm -hmm. Well, the book has some kind of racy parts in there, <laughs> some sexual, sexually explicit parts, um, and many of them are very negative, there are scenes of issues of 
rape and brutality, not just with the black women in the book, but also to the white women as well. Um, but you also showed strength and courage um, and a sense of love for family unit as well in the book with uh, your character, Salome, and her husband and, and how they stayed together. So how, how difficult was it for you to acknowledge the negative sexual um, uh, history and encounters that occurred within your family? You know, I, I, I and my editors at Amazon were very surprised to hear that because I, in, in telling the stories of, of uh, these people, I was reflecting what to me was the reality of the 1870s. The story starts in 1872. And this was a world in which white men dominated. They held all the power. Even their white wives did not dare defy them openly. If they did, there was a price to pay. And it was that dominance, and especially in, this, in the character, uh, Lord Henry Harden, who was the wealthy farm owner, who carried the arrogance of uh, his belief of being descended from uh, uh, dukes in, in England, uh, the British aristocracy. He especially had a sense of, of command, of power, that he could do what he wanted to whomever he wanted because of who he was. And from that is what stems the action of what others have said is this, I think it was called um, gratuitous uh, uh, sexual violence. I didn't see anything gratuitous about it at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that was very, very, very powerful. So with respect to your publishing experience, which is again, different yeah. than, than our other two authors. Would you want to give us a little description of, of your sure. publishing journey? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I consider myself extremely fortunate. I, as you can tell from this, I, I like to write down family oral histories. My first book was Paige from a Tennessee Journal, and that was the story of my grandmother and my uh, three grandfathers uh, in Tennessee. I entered that uh, book, in, that novel, into the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award Contest in uh, 2009. And I was just hoping if I could just get to the quarterfinals, I'd be so happy. Uh, unbeknownst to me, Amazon decided, uh, they had a plan, they had a master plan. Uh, they were going to take entrants from this contest, non-winners, and they were going to enter the field of traditional publishing. Amazon has challenged traditional publishers. And uh, even though I didn't win the contest, I did advance far enough to be noticed by um, was a, a tremendous uh, acquisitions editor, uh, Terry Goodman. He picked up my book and he said, I want you. I got a telephone number, a telephone call, and uh, an email from him. And of course, I spent the whole summer thinking, you know, this has got to be a fake. Nobody really wants to publish my book. And he convinced me that, yes, we want you. So they published um, Page from Tennessee Journal in 2010. Uh, it did extremely well. And then they picked me up for this one. And then there's a third book called Paris Noir. So I've got three books published with Amazon. Okay. And I feel very fortunate. That's great. So would you share some of uh, your story with us? I shall, I shall. Um, okay, this is gonna be three pages. And this is from the, um, this is the last three pages of chapter two. And this is from the point of view of the wealthy white farm owner. Uh, he wants to be called Lord Henry Harden because he's carrying this legacy of being descended from a British Duke. And uh, he, but he has a problem. Um, he's got, his family came to the Americas in the early 1600s, now we're in 1872, but his wife, Bertha, has not given him a living child. In fact, a month ago, she's just miscarried their fifth baby, and he's very worried. I mean, what's gonna happen to his legacy? There's no heir. 
a few months ago, he was just uh, delighted to discover that his, um, his uh, black called a colored servant, Salome, was pregnant with his baby. And he's been living anxiously. Is she going to be able to deliver him a living child? Um, he's in the uh, back room uh, on his first floor of his mansion. This is the little room off the kitchen called the birthing room. And uh, Salome has just delivered the baby and is alive. He, uh, she's in there with the three other black women, Maddie Lou, the midwife, Georgia, and Tessie. But these women are all acting in a very odd fashion, and Henry is not a man to tolerate any kind of uh, uh, disturbance in, in his path. What he wants, he wants. So he's not happy. So he's saying to us, hand me the girl. Henry stood. He'd waited these five minutes to get his first look at his daughter. Maddie Lou, Georgia, and even Tessie shook their heads in unison. No, sir, Maddie Lou declared. Um, I, I, I'm aiming to say, to say, her eyes grew wide. No more twaddle. Henry walked to Maddie Lou and held out his arms. The midwife stood there like stone. Henry laid his hands on the blue coverlet he'd ordered his weavers to make just for this child. Maddie Lou stepped back with the babe in her arms. She shook her head. Sir, it's just that, that the child needs her mama's tip before, before Maddie's little face sunk into a frown. Show me how to hold the baby, Henry commanded. Salome will feed her, but not right now. Now give her to me. Salome's sniffles floated off the bed as she rolled to her side. I can't. I just can't feed her. Maddie Lou, women were bedeviling him again. He had to tolerate Bertha, but these others, these colored servants, never. Hand over the baby. It's just that uh, uh, maybe best if her ma first take a look at her. Oh. The cry escaped from Salome as she rolled on her back, her face grimacing with each movement. Is something wrong with her? She turned to Henry as she pushed up on her elbows. Henry touched his chest where his crucifix would have hung if he dared wear it. He'd wanted fatherhood so long he never even considered his child, he, his wish could be granted with a deformed child. Has his child been born with a hunchback or one leg shorter than the other? Perhaps water on the brain? Henry pulled the warming wrap from his daughter's face and looked at the wriggling infant. Maddie Lou shook her head. Now Salome looked worried. She rolled to her side and tried to slip her legs off the bed. Georgia held her back. The midwife turned to Salome. It ain't never good when it comes out this cup like this. Maddie Lou kept her eyes away from Henry. Henry looked at the women. Why all this commotion? Now Salome appeared worried. He turned back to the screaming baby, who looked perfectly proportioned. The baby girl's eyes opened and shut in a frenzy of flailing arms and legs. Her, her eyes, they were blue like his own, and her immigrant grandfather, Tyrone O'Brien. The baby squalling brought out the redness in her skin, but underneath, Henry could see this child was as white as he. Maddie Lou dared brush past him, still clutching the newborn, and bent down to the new mother. Uh, don't you fear it, none, Salome, honey. Uh, most young'uns when it comes out looking like this, they turns darker when it gets a little older. She laid the child on the cot next to Salome. Her hair, her hair! Salome's face reflected panic. Seemed to me like it's yellow, but is it gonna turn nappy? She pleaded with Maddie Lou. Not the wrong color eyes and straight hair, too. Please, Lord. Hair? What was Salome going on about? She had tried her mightiest to deliver him a dead baby. Now she looked the picture of the perfect concerned mother. What are the baby's hair? Henry peered at the light-colored fuzz atop his daughter's head. He turned back to Salome. Her own hair, caught between light chestnut and oak brown, swung in a long braid down her back. Henry loved the way Salome's hair waved between 
crinkles and curls, allowing his fingers to unravel each strand. Peek behind the ear, Georgia said, interrupting his reverie. True color come out there. <laughs> Maddie Lou grunted as she flicked the baby's ear. Uh-uh, she groaned, same color. <laughs> Henry caught the midwife's glance at Salome. Maddie Lou looked as though the devil had run a foot race with her and won. What was all this talk about hair and color? Does she have all her fingers and toes? He demanded of the barely competent Maddie Lou. Ain't a thing wrong with this here girl's body, and Lord Harden, sir. It's just that she, she, well, sir, she just don't look like no colored girl ought. What are you talking about? Henry's day had been much too long. His patience was in frazzles, but that wasn't it. Maybe Maddie Lou, at close to 40, was too old for this job. Will this child be able to walk and talk like a normal person? His voice was gruff. He knew it had been a mistake to end slavery and allow colleagues to say their mind with too few consequences. Maddie Lou held out the infant to Salome. The new mother slid down the bed, her arms clamped around the curving sheet. Maddie Lou, and returned his glare on the midwife and away from the cantankerous Salome. Out with it, woman. Tell me what you're studying on about, or I'll dismiss you from the farm and make sure no other landowner in these parts hires you. No, Lord Harden, the son ain't no need to be doing all that. She turned from Henry to Salome. I ain't keeping nothing from, uh, that is to say, she plucked the baby from the bed and held out the bundle to him. Henry gathered the child into his arms. He struggled to keep the squirming blanket from slipping to the floor. This definitely was not like carrying a five pound sack of rice. Well, he couldn't keep his eyes off his baby. What is the problem? She don't look colored enough, Salome raised her voice, though she kept her eyes on the child. A white looking colored girl ain't gonna live no life except one of misery. Henry stared at the babe. How white looking will this child be? Powerful, sir. The midwife ran a finger over the baby's hair. It might curl up a mite by and by, but it ain't never going to be real nappy. Mary Lou looked as though she'd thrown the first fistful of dirt into a grave. Good! Without a glance at the baby's mother, Henry headed for the door, leading into the kitchen, his daughter in his arms. Mm -hmm. The Duke of Union God. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And so I hope that everyone in the audience has been thinking about uh, some questions and th being inspired by what you've heard from these, these wonderful authors. And so we're going to have a period of some question and answers. And we have a... Yeah, my phone. <laughs> So does anybody have uh, a burning question for any one of our authors? Uh, Marie Graves. OK, this question is for um, uh, Francine Howard. Um, OK, so what is, your, what is the reaction of your in-laws and your family members to this book? What, what kind of things have they said to you in response to the book? I think they've been all right, because I told them in the writing process that I would disguise enough of the events that they would not be immediately identified. I tried hard to do that. OK, we have a question over here. Huh? Reading Sorrows of the San Francisco the Alumni Chapter um, uh, and our guests, I wanted to ask the young lady in the middle about your reaction and your relationship currently with your mother mm -hmm. after having wrote, written uh, so many things about your past. Um, how did that affect 
your relationship? And did she understand that you really just needed the opportunity to process and vent those things? Mm -hmm. And did she really come to an understanding of the fact that you are more than just being her baby? Mm. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, some, some stuff hit home. So she actually cried about some things when she read it. Uh, I wrote it because I, feel, I felt like I've been trying to say it for so long and it, it wasn't being heard, so she heard it at that moment. Uh, but I realized when I wrote the book, I thought like, oh, this is it, I'm now on the other side, but I realized that I hadn't touched the tip of the iceberg. It was the beginning of my healing journey. And so, um, and actually we didn't heal together. So currently, yeah, it's, it's, we, it, it didn't work out <laughs> that way, but I was glad that I wrote it. I was glad that she was able to read it and we were able to talk about those things at that time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have a question from one of our younger members of the audience. Hi. Hi. Um, how long did it take all of you to write your books? Oh, let's we'll start with Sarah. <laughs> Can I ask you, are you a writer? Depends. <laughs> you know, th that, that for me is one of the hardest questions to answer because I'm never quite sure when a story begins. And for me, I started writing a story that had three main characters in it. And then it sort of changed and evolved and it became this story. So I think I had 18 months that were quite intense focusing on it, but it could have been even longer. So that's a couple years for a small book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and um, yeah. for me, some of the poems in my book were already written and some things were half written when I decided. And because I was also working and taking care of kids, I feel like it took me longer than if I wasn't, but it took me about a year to do mine. Mm -hmm. and, and Francie? Well, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, in many ways, I don't feel like a real writer because these stories are family stories and given to me. All I have to do is write them down. So this one took me about, about a year. And, and that is actually relatively short for a big book like authors. I mean, we hear stories of five to 10 20. plus years in, 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 writing, in writing a book. So that's very impressive. Do we have another question? Okay, um, I'm questioning character development. How do you develop a character like when you meet somebody who seems unusual or quirky? Do you kind of like take some notes about this person mm -hmm. and maybe incorporate or find out more about them later? How do you develop characters? That's you, Sarah. You. You, have, you have interesting characters. <laughs> um, I, I sometimes think I should take more notes than I actually do. <laughs> but for me, uh, you know, a, a turning point for me in my writing in some respects was I had the immense privilege of doing a workshop with Anna Devere Smith. And I think as a writer, often we are, we are so much in our heads. And uh, I, I did this workshop with her and all the participants, she asked them to bring what they were working on and most of the participants were actors and I'm not, but I was working on a story about, at the time it was a short story about a, a cleaner in an airport, a Nigerian woman, again, a woman sort of in her 50s. And I had in my mind that this woman, she worked in Seattle, Tacoma Airport and she would greet service men and women as they came back. And uh, she also had a child who was fighting at, at that time or in the, in the military in, over in Iraq. And uh, I, I didn't really have a strong, you know, so I had this story, but it wasn't kind of all that compelling to me. And then um, Anna Devere Smith got every workshop person to do something. And she said to me, you know, she tilts her head, Sarah, I want you to act this character for three minutes without words. And I thought, she, she'd said before, you know, what scares you the most? You know, dancing, singing, and I'm like, oh, everything scares me. But when she said, do it without words, that really scared me. <laughs> and 
but it was the it was the most profound experience for me because in preparing for the workshop, I was walking around the house thinking about this character, thinking how am I going to act this character with no words, and after a period of a few days, the character then really became alive and. Here was this Nigerian person, she's working in the airport, she's picking up trash, you know, she's really, you know, no one really sees her, no one knows her story, no one knows that her son is in the army, and, and it, it just came out. Yeah. And so I think that was very pivotal in terms of thinking now with my characters. I walk around with them, and I talk to them, and I talk with them, and I, and I act them, even though I can't act. Uh, that's been very powerful, and so I did that with my characters, and this is why most of my characters are in the first person. Most of the characters are quite invisible in society, and there was a certain point at which they all turned to me and said, Sarah, will you stop writing us in the third person? We need first person voices. Mm. Well, Francine, you have a lot of dialogue in your stories, in your book, a lot of conversation yes. that occurs amongst your characters. How did you get into that, your, your head, to articulate their conversations? Well, I, I think it's just the uh, opposite. Uh, I, don't, uh, I get into their heads. They just, they're just there. In the, in the uh, Daughter of Union County, I knew the outlines of my husband's story, but of course I, I didn't know, nor did he or any of the in-laws know anything about this. Lord Henry Harden, because he was died in 1898. Uh, and I didn't know if he had a wife or not, so I had to, those people were just, they sort of had to appear. But uh, character development is one of the elements of, that writers really struggle with. For me, I can, I see the time, the, the historical context in which they live, I, I see their worldview, and I see them, and, and uh, like my fellow author here, they, they become alive to me, and I see them walking and talking, conversing with one another, what they're wearing, and again, I just have to write it down. Okay. That's true. I, you know. <laughs> I'd like to know what the difference, uh, can you hear? I'd, Not well. Louder. I'd like to know the, the difference between journaling, prose, and vignettes, and how do you put it all together to be an interesting story to persons other than yourself? So the difference between journaling and poetry and the, the, the you want to tackle that? <laughs> you want um, to oh, so because my book is so vulnerable and intimate, it, it is, in a sense, like a journal, but with journaling, of course, you're uncensored. I, ideally, that helps you to be able to journal, or it's cathartic. You, uh, when I journal, that's what it is. It's uncensored, it's cathartic. I just say whatever I want to say. But it's important for me that uh, not to just spill out, right, to control it, to shape it a little bit so that it's not just blah to the public. So for me, that would be the difference between <laughs> journaling and presenting a work that feels like a journal, but is not actually a journal. I don't know. Did that satisfy what you were asking? OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, now, let me ask, ask a question about social media mm -hmm. and the, the u proliferation and the use of social media and marketing your work, because I know that all of you have websites and YouTube and Twitter and Facebook <laughs> and, and all that. So how do you cope with that? Is that uh, something you embrace as a positive, or is it a burden? <laughs> you want to start? Sarah? <laughs> I think it, it has its pros and cons, and I resisted social media until a year ago, and my publisher said, no way, you have to do something, so take your pick. So I picked Facebook, and um, it, it, actually over the last two months, it's been an interesting period for me because my, my first book, Independence, was made the mandatory read for all students in Nigeria applying to university. So this has been, and Nigeria's a pretty big population, so I've been receiving um, messages through Facebook, Facebook and through my website that range from um, 
you know, we love your book. It's inspired me to, your book really sucks. Uh, or your book is too long. Where is the shortcut? Uh, you know, <laughs> please give me a summary. Um, you know, so, I, so for a writer, this is really interesting because there's so many stories for me as I'm sort of eavesdropping and watching and seeing what people are saying. Um, uh, so, you know, but it, it's like Francine was saying in terms of the reviews, you get five star reviews, you get one star reviews in terms, you know, so I don't take comments, yeah. you know, too personally. It's a privilege for me. It's humbling to have lots of people reading um, that first book. And uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I uh, but then the other thing about social media, I don't know how, you know, you feel about this. It can also be quite distracting. And so I have to be, but I find email quite distracting. I find people on the street quite <laughs> distracting. It's, it's part of life, right? So I draw on it as, as much as I can, but I also um, try not to, uh, get sucked into too much social media time. Well, Mauricia, you use YouTube as your one of your vehicles mm. to... Yes, so I, I took a course on how to uh, use social media to uh, promote myself once I started making music, but it's the same concept I would imagine it can be transferred over for the uh, writing. Yeah. So I'm on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. <laughs> then I have teenagers who keep me up to speed with it. They got me on Snapchat. <laughs> um, and it, it can be extremely distracting. Sometimes I just completely take a break. I haven't actually looked at my website in a while because I've been wanting to upgrade it. And that's a process, changing things with the... So I, I get kind of like tired sometimes with it. But um, it... It has, and, and, and as far as the reviews of my book, for me, it's been me asking people who've read it and who've told me, oh, I like your book. I'm like, okay, go put it on Goodreads. Go put it, so all my reviews are great <laughs> as a result. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I, is there, what was the specific question with the social media? Or? No, just, you know, you, you use it in a different way as a, po as, oh, as yeah. your positive, as, as mm -hmm. marketing, for your marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, as marketing. Marketing. Yeah. And then yeah. there's oh. newsletters, people get into, there's so much. Uh-huh. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> Any other question? Um, my question is to Ms. Howard, but also I would like the other panelists to uh, address it also. And it's this, uh, Ms. Howard, to what extent is your uh, development of the theme of passing in your book based on your own family's history, but also the concept of the double consciousness that W.E.B. Du Bois talks about, and also whether or not you were inspired by the Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemmings issue. Hmm. Thank you, uh, interesting questions. Um, the only uh, passing that was done was in the in-laws family and that was uh, uh, in, in, his, in my husband's immediate family, only he and his brother out of nine siblings were able to pass and uh, neither one of them chose to do it on a routine basis. Um, I think it's a very deeply painful topic in the African American community, and I think it has been forever. Um, yes, I'm aware of um, uh, Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson, but no, that didn't factor into uh, my decision to go with the, the in-law, Branson said she was uh, passing as a white woman. And anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah. I, I think, you know, this issue of double consciousness is an interesting one. And, um, you know, I think as women, sometimes having a, this notion of triple consciousness. Um, for me personally, um, it's been very interesting for me to have had the privilege of living in different parts of the world and to see how race is socially constructed in different parts of the world. Uh, the 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 one context in which there would have been room for me to pass, not necessarily as white, but as colored, 
uh, was in Southern Africa, and my husband is Zimbabwean, and so that has a particular, um, you know, apartheid, the, the, the yeah. black, Indian, colored, and white. And uh, so, particularly earlier on, um, closer to the time of independence, I, I was aware that people would look at me and see me as colored, and I would be very um, colored in the Southern African sense, and I would be very insistent on the fact that I, I am black, um, you know, in, in terms of not wanting to put myself in a, in a privileged uh, context. But, you know, just as you ask that question, um, there's another interesting layer to this notion of um, passing, which I've become more and more conscious of, which is, for me, um, the opportunity for me to pass as um, an African. And so I'm very conscious of the differences that people, that mainstream society can sometimes try and forge between Africans and African Americans. And, you know, particularly someone like me that has a British accent, you know, in some ways, you know, and someone who has a PhD and so forth, can, I can be put on a pedestal, I'm aware of this, and said to be different to African Americans. And I think it's something that I feel a particular need to be very conscious of. Um, I am black like anyone else, and I'm not better than African Americans, which is some, which is a, a root that is often, um, I'm not being very articulate about this, but I think Africans, African immigrants have to be very conscious mm -hmm. of race in America and its roots and what this means. We are no better, we are the same. Mm -hmm. And we all have particular fights that we need to fight together to make sure that equality is a reality in America. So. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. Questioner Tavis. Yes, um, just wanted to say excellent presentation. But my question is for uh, Ms. Francine Howard, but I guess, because uh, I really don't know the time genres. Did you think about um, uh, how your audience, when you wrote, like starting back in 1870? Because I, I know, um, I have to confess, I don't get to read as much as I used to when I was younger, you know, before this thing came along. <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> but um, I noticed that a lot of the younger people don't really read a lot of the older stuff. You know, like my first book, my first book I read was Black Like Me. You know, uh, so yes, yes. And I grew up reading all the older stuff and mm -hmm. uh, the history. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Albert Herbert, the, the histories of the Negro peoples, volumes one, two, three. That's the type of stuff I read when I was growing up. But I don't see that type of work mm -hmm. being done anymore. So, do you uh, uh, do you like? Are you conscious of of the time frame when you make your work? Just try to get younger readers, or and also, who, what age group reads your books? Again, thank you for the question. Um, when I write my stories, I feel a compulsion to tell the oral histories of the people I'm talking about. I, I feel that these people were so disenfranchised, both uh, by in-laws in the Daughter of Union County and also in my first book, Page for Tennessee Journal. So I'm sort of driven to write down their stories, more so than I'm conscious about who's going to read them. Uh, my audience appears to be um, across racial lines, and it appears to be mostly and here you're right, it's uh, people from, I'd say, mid-30s on up seem to be interested in, in this genre. And my genre primarily is historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But one more question here. Yeah. Yes, I have a question for all three authors. Uh, first question is, I want to ask if you're, have, are you familiar with uh, these three authors that I'm going to mention, that I, the only books that I read that really had a lasting impression on me within the last two decades. One of the authors was, uh, um, I think his name. Uh, the title of the book that he wrote is called Visions for Black Men. And his author is Naeem Akbar. That's the first one I like from the author. If you meet with that author, Naeem, N-A hyphen I M A K B A R Akbar. And the title of that book that I read uh, over two decades ago, a decade, whatever, two decades, it still has a lasting impression on me. Uh, the second one author is uh, 
Check A C G K H A. Middle name A N T A. Last name D O P. O P. Check A Auntie D O P. I think from West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote two or three books that really, uh, to this day, still affects me. You know, and these book, these I read, these books I read affect me from the, from a viewpoint of the way I was raised in the South and reading the Holy Bible. You know what I'm saying? Because I deal, my, my mindset is just locked in on nonfiction and stories that African Americans, you know, can relate to as far as, you know, our history. You know what I'm saying? That, and because back when I was growing up as a kid in, down in Alabama in the 50s, 60s, uh, there was very, either little at all or very limited uh, black movies or black history. And then there was so much uh, isms of the ones, the powers that be that control our history, you know what I'm saying, that was leaving out a lot of stuff that I only knew in advance when I was going to uh, segregated school, you know what I'm saying, where it was all black, you know what I'm saying, before the Brown versus Verification uh, bill was passed and that. Okay, and the third author is Francis Cress Wessing, Visions for Black Men. When I read those three books, and I kept going back over them, you know what I'm saying, because it was something about the spiritual, spiritual something I was going through of truth of uh, what our culture and race have been through, through racism, through uh, exploitation, of European exploitation of the African Americans. And through this one other book, I can't think of the name of the title, I mean the author, but it's called uh, The Betrayal of Africa. It was, it was the author is in the Canada, he was in Canada. And it was, when I read those books, and even right now, the only book all my life as a, as a sibling, I mean, as like maybe six years old, five years old, is the Holy Bible. Because my grandfather was a Baptist minister, and my mentor as a kid growing up to this day was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And yeah. I can identify with all the, the, a lot of what the marches they went through, you know what I'm saying? Even though I grew up in the Bible Belt area. Uh, yeah. Well, I think, so you know, not, I, not, to, not, to, not to interrupt you, because I think what you're, what okay. you're, you're saying is, 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 so, is so critical. Right and important in terms of why we have these programs like this. And I know that, no, no, I, we appreciate it. I saw some of the nods. Mm -hmm. I wasn't familiar with the books that you've, you've mm -hmm. articulated, but I think some of our panelists yeah. are. Ex exactly. Okay. And so that's why we're, we're so happy to have this event here at the, uh, San Francisco Library, and they have a, there's a fabulous African American uh, the book section here dev devoted to the library. And Naomi Jelks, who is our our librarian liaison, has been so helpful in um, facilitating this and and keeping the the uh, the collections for African American authors you know, here at the library for public access. And so I don't know if anybody wants to just, you know. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm uh -huh. familiar with all of those authors. All and them. Yes, and. Um, Which one well, well, I'm familiar with all of them. I, did, I didn't necessarily delve into their work, but check out the Diop, obviously, because I uh, have the, the French background and him being Senegalese, so that was, yeah, and then also what his work uh, has done for it. So just the, the summary and understanding of his work without having gone into it. And I saw, did see a video of him, and I, he had an interpreter, and I was so jealous because I was like, I could do that. I wish I was his interpreter. <laughs> but that's it. Well, yeah. thank, well thank you. <laughs> Yeah. So I just wanted to quickly yeah. add, I, uh -huh. I just want, wanted to add in terms of, I'm familiar with Che Canta Diop as well, um, out of the three that you've mentioned. And what, you know, when I, as you're speaking and you're speaking about the influence of the Bible and, uh, as well, 
I think of James Baldwin because J James Baldwin, uh, first of all, I'm really glad that you're, you know, it's always great when people are very excited about books. Um, you know, you, you, fiction may not particularly speak to you, but there's great nonfiction. And the reason I, I raise Baldwin is because he has written a lot of essays and, you know, it, with his meetings in Paris with people like um, Chekanta Diop and uh, Senghor and, and others. And so I think if, you know, I, I would like to challenge you and say if, you, if you're not as familiar perhaps with Baldwin's essays and, and um, yeah, so he's, yeah. I haven't read it. I know his name, and I know that he's in it. I haven't read his book. <laughs> well, I hate to, I hate no, to, but cut, I will look it up. Cut, cut this off. But, but you're going to have an opportunity to continue conversation as we go into our reception, where you can purchase the books of these authors and um, get them signed and engage in a little bit more, more dialogue. And I would like to thank all of you very much. And I'd like to thank the audience for these questions. <laughs>